Hey guys, welcome, welcome back to my channel. My name is Micah, this is Winston. As always, we're just going to dive right into this. This is Caesar and the Gallic Boards. This is the first one. This is going to be a very long series. I'm actually very excited. This is Battle of Brepic... 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 Oh my god, he's retarded. He didn't even have a helmet on. Oh, my oh shit. 58 BC. I'm sorry guys, these, some of these old um, witch calls kind of messed me up. I'm sure this is probably one of the most easiest freaking enunciations ever. Bibrikitty. I'm just going to let him do it. And whenever he says it, and it's going to be super easy. I'm going to look like a jackass. Either way, let's go ahead and dive into The Gauls were one of Rome's oldest and most bitter enemies. They had sacked Rome and throughout the centuries fought alongside the Republic's most dangerous adversaries, including Pyrrhus and Hannibal. By the end of the 2nd century BC, southern Gaul was largely subdued, however there was still tension in northern Gaul, particularly along the Rhine. These tensions would ultimately climax in the Gallic Wars, the conflict that would shape the future of Western Europe for centuries to come giving rise to the Holy Roman Empire and modern-day France, the conflict that would forever etch the name Gaius Julius Caesar in the annals of history. Not only all that, but you, we also have to think about it. If it wasn't for the Gallic Wars, then they wouldn't have subdued Britain, which means that we probably wouldn't have the Britain that we have. Like, all of the castles, all the feudalism, all of the fact that, you know, everybody wanted to have an empire and... All that stuff came from you know these guys so it's just or you know in that area anyway because you know, obviously this is happening all over the freaking world but mainly in that area the just the the um civiliz the civilization that came from it is just you know it's kind of unreal to think about it and it is interesting to think about like what would it be look like if you know what i'm saying uh rome hadn't reached its you know figurative arm out that far you know what i'm saying I don't know, one of those things, let's keep going. Rome had been rocked by almost half a century of civil wars, and the Republic was in decline. Both Marius and Sulla had marched on Rome, highlighting the ineffectiveness of the system for maintaining a large empire, and the fact that the legionaries were more loyal to their generals than to the state. Following this chaotic period, three men had established an unofficial alliance to effectively control the Republic. Which that would be Rome's, um, like one of Rome's signatures throughout its entire um, <coughs> existence was its uh, legionaries being more, uh, you know, um, loyal to its generals than more than to its uh emperor most of the times to their emperors because some most of, sometimes they had some really great general emperors like you know uh aurelian and all them but and obviously um caesar and all them but there also was some pretty crappy ones that you know i'm saying their generals got way more love than they than the emperors got for sure public let's see this was the first triumvirate, consisting of the famous general Pompey the Great, the richest man in Rome, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. Caesar had been consul the year before in 59 BC, but his political campaigning had left him in debt and made him many enemies in Rome. He needed to make money fast and gain enough military success to keep his political adversaries at bay. When the time came for distributing provinces for Caesar to govern as proconsul, he was able to use his political allies to secure Cisalpine Gaul, Illyricum, and Transalpine Gaul for an unprecedented five years. This put Caesar in control of four veteran legions, the 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, all of whom had fought with Caesar before in Hispania and were loyal to him. They had a total of roughly 22,000 legionaries, plus auxiliaries. Caesar now had the men he needed. All he needed was an excuse for war. Fortunately for Caesar, a Celtic tribe, the Helvetii, was planning a migration into Gaul in 58 BC. Their leader, Oregtorix, had formed a confederation with a number of neighbouring tribes, the Tolingi, Latubrigi, Rauraki and Boii, 
and now they numbered 368,000 men, women and children. Oregtorix had even convinced them all to burn their homes in order to leave no option of failure. However, soon he was accused of being a tyrant and was forced to commit suicide. Command passed to Divico. Divico was determined to stick to the plan and began amassing supplies in order to start pouring into Gaul. To do this, they would either have to pass through the land of the Roman ally Edui and the province of Transalpine Gaul, or take the longer route through the mountain passes in the north. The Romans had built up a healthy fear of migrating tribes following the Cimbrian War in 113-101 BC, and so Caesar, hearing of this, was only too willing to come to the rescue of the Edui. He took the only available legion in the area. Yeah, see, all of this right here, I, I'm pretty sure is why a big reason why he was so loved after this, because this was like tribes, Gallic tribes and freaking Germanic tribes were this such a huge problem on the Gallic, um, you know, uh, uh, front or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like nobody wanted to, uh, I'm sure not a lot of people wanted to live out there. The people who were living out there were living in constant strife and stuff like that of these huge, um, or these tribes that are, do, you know, doing freaking hit and run tactics or, you know, uh, trying to get, you know, money or, you know, money, food, women, who, who knows, you know what I'm saying? So, all types of stuff. So, I'm, I'm pretty sure that was like the huge, like, that just went over everyone because they didn't have to worry about that anymore. But yeah, let's get, let's get that. And force marched them up to Geneva, destroying the bridge on the Rhone that provided access into Transalpine Gaul. The Helvetii appealed to Caesar, asking for military access through Roman lands and promising they would not attack. Caesar played for time, pretending to consider this offer for almost 15 days. Using this time, his legion was able to construct a fortified embankment almost 5 meters high, stretching 20 miles along the riverbank. With the legion manning the embankment and now in a stronger position, Caesar denied the Helvetii access and refused to allow them to cross. Some of the Helvetii ignored this and attempted to cross nonetheless in small boats, but were prevented from doing so by the legionaries throwing javelins and shooting arrows into them. With the southern route thus blocked, the Helvetii decided to take the longer northern route through the mountains into Gaul. Leaving his top lieutenant, Labienus, in command, Caesar returned to Italy to levy a further two legions and to pull the other three veteran legions out of their winter quarters in Aquileia, bringing his total to approximately 33,000 legionaries plus auxiliaries. Despite Labienus being in a strong position to easily block the mountain pass, the Helvetii managed to push into Gallic territories and began ravaging the land. The Gauls pleaded with Caesar to intervene and chase the Helvetii out, and Caesar, yet again, was only too willing to help, marching his legions into the Gallic territories. The decision of Labienus to not hold the Helvetii in the mountains was likely an order received from Caesar. The Celts were now in open terrain, which better suited the Roman legions, and their pillaging of Gaul gave Caesar an excuse to intervene. Word reached Caesar that the Helvetii were currently attempting a crossing at the Ara River. They had been crossing in four large groups, using many rafts and boats, but due to the size of the horde and their lack of organization, the crossing had already taken them days, and one group was still yet to cross. Caesar took his legions and swiftly marched to the river. Quickly forming his legions into battle formation, Caesar fell upon the Celts waiting to cross. Caught unaware, unprepared and encumbered by their baggage, the Helvetii did not even have enough time to form a proper battle line. The fighting was over quickly, with the whole stranded group being killed or fleeing into the nearby woods, whilst the other three groups could do nothing but watch helplessly from the other side of the river. The main Helvetii force began to move on, and, not wanting to lose the initiative, Caesar quickly built a bridge across the river and moved all of his six legions across. 
the crossing that had taken the Celts 20 days had taken the Romans just one. These are just some of the freaking greatest, like, you know, some of the great things that we see that the Romans would do in order to get, like, in war and stuff like that. Because, I mean, in, I mean, obviously building a bridge today isn't, like, that big of a deal. And obviously Napoleon did it, like, you know, time and time again. But this is, like, freaking in, like, what, 40 BC, 30 some, like, you know what I'm saying? This is, you know, this is pretty long time ago like it was fucking 2000 years ago on top of that i just think it's interesting seeing them do their thing because i mean if you're like if you guys know about like the the siege of masada that is such a crazy story like how they built a literal freaking mountain on top on the side of a mountain to get up to this freaking this uh this castle essentially is insane but like yeah i just yeah i love it caesar began tailing the helvetii waiting for the right time to strike There were a few minor cavalry skirmishes, but nothing decisive. Caesar did once manage to find a battlefield that was advantageous, and even had Labienus in position behind the enemy. However, due to poor communication from his scouts, Caesar was forced to pull back from the battlefield. This caused a delay in Caesar's plan, and he was beginning to run low on rations. He decided to head for the nearby town of Bibracta to resupply his army before continuing the pursuit. As he began to march off, however, Divico gave chase, harassing the rear of the Roman army. Caesar sent his cavalry and light infantry to fight a delaying action in order to buy time to deploy his main force on a nearby hill. The four veteran legions formed three lines at the front, with the two newly levied legions, along with the auxiliaries, positioned further up the hill. These men were not tested in battle, and so were not expected to do any of the fighting. Instead, they were to guard the baggage and were spread thin across the hill to seemingly increase the size of Caesar's army. The Helvetii, numbering somewhere between 60 to 90,000 warriors, had successfully fought off the Roman cavalry and light infantry, forcing them to retreat. Now they had formed their infantry into a tightly packed shield wall and advanced on the Romans. The front two lines of legionaries opened the battle with a volley of javelins. These hampered the Helvetii by becoming stuck in their shields, forcing them to drop them and break into a looser formation. With the shield wall in disarray, the Roman front lines charged into melee. The fighting was intense and tough, but the Romans' discipline and experience gave them the edge. Slowly, they began to get the upper hand, with the Helvetii being forced back to a nearby mountain. Yeah, I know a lot of, uh, like, tribal, um, whenever a lot of these guys would go into war <clears throat> that weren't disciplined and stuff like that, like the Romans and stuff, that's why you would see them, like, doing, like, their little, uh, you know, uh, warrior screams and hell screams and all that stuff. Is A lot of it was, you know, some of it was to try and intimidate the an enemy, but a lot of it was just to, you know what I'm saying, to push yourself to go forward, because... You know what I'm saying? That's like probably like one of the most uh, nerve-wracking things because you know you're probably you, you're probably gonna die. And if everyone else around you gives up and starts routing away or running away and routes and stuff and gets routed, I mean, you're pretty much fucked. So it's it's just one of those things where uh, that screen is like, you know, what I'm saying the only way that they can get through it. But yeah. However, as the Romans pressed up the mountain, a portion of the Helvetii allies, composed of Boii and Tilingi, roughly 15,000 warriors, entered the battle. These men had been acting as a rearguard, protecting the camp, and now they fell on the Roman flank, threatening to encircle them. The Helvetii, bolstered by the arrival of their allies, began pushing back with renewed vigour. With the two front lines of legionaries already engaging the Helvetii on the mountain, Caesar committed his final line of veterans, which had been acting as a reserve. After hours of hard fighting, the Helvetii on the mountain were eventually broken and forced from the battle. However, the Boi and Tilingi fell back to the camp to make a last stand. Using their baggage wagons, they formed a makeshift rampart and continued the fight, hurling missiles down into the Roman ranks. 
This is where the fighting was the most difficult, as the Boii were famed warriors and fought desperately. Finally, after fighting long into the night, the third line was able to break into the camp, ending the battle. The battle had lasted almost 12 hours. Caesar had lost perhaps 5,000 men, whilst the Helvetii had lost around 40 to 60,000. Of the 368,000 people who began the migration, only 130,000 were now left. Caesar, with no cavalry to speak of, was not able to give chase immediately, and gave his men three days in order to recover from the battle before starting the pursuit. The Helvetii, seeing the Romans chasing them once more, surrendered completely and were forced to return to their homeland and made a vassal of Rome, acting as a buffer between Roman and Germanic lands. Caesar had achieved his aim of gaining a swift military victory, and for now he would be able to hold off his political enemies in Rome. Furthermore, the Romans had now shown themselves to be a powerful force in the Gallic theatre. After his victory, Caesar rested in Bibracte for a short time before moving on. Rumour had already reached him of a Germanic tribe that had crossed the Rhine and was terrorising Gaul. The Gallic Wars were just starting, and in our future videos we will talk more about them, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like hey guys, we're going to end it there. So yeah, definitely about to get crazy. Um, damn, yeah. It, I guess it's just one of those things where, if you, in my opinion, like Rome, just their discipline in an ancient time was like their their freaking hidden, like you know, what I'm saying, uh, hidden freaking ace in the hole. Like you know, what I'm saying, with so many uh, tribes and everything and. They're, you know, all these people are, are scared, they're not disciplined at all, they're just, they're probably uh, freaking conscripted, you know, farmers or whatever have you, and instead of hearing screaming on the other side of the battlefield, all you hear is, you know, screaming in Latin, which is already a freaking, uh, you know, intimidating uh, language, you just hear screaming in Latin, and um, you just hear uh, their their metal just clinging around, you don't hear nothing, No, you just hear marching, clinging around, and... and you know, commands being uh, given. That's it's. I, I guarantee you, that's probably a very um, intimidating, uh, you know, sight to see. But in case, so if you guys liked the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I see. Take peace out to Winston. I'll see you guys on another one. I'm out.